So with that said, our next speaker is Evie Bromstead. Evie is a uh, environmental science and engineering PhD student at Clarkson University's Institute for Sustainable Environment. And she works in Dr. Michael Twiss's limnology lab, studying mercury cycling in freshwater riparian wetlands with a focus on the St. Lawrence River. And she hopes to become a professor where she can further research on freshwater wetland systems, teach and inspire future students. So with that, I will turn it over to Evie. Can everybody hear me? No? Okay. Okay. How about now? Is that good? How's that? No. Can you pull it out of your pocket for me? We're on. So just test, test, test. You might have to speak up pretty loudly. Okay. Do you want me to hook it? Thank you for your patience. Just right on the outside of your pocket. There you go. Okay. Move up a little bit closer to your mouth. There you go. All right. Better? Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you for that introduction, and thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited to talk to you all about uh, Plan 2014 and potential impacts on mercury in the St. Lawrence River. I'd like to start by thanking our funding and partnerships with the National Science Foundation, the Great Lakes Research Consortium, New York Sea Grant, New York State Water Resources Institute, and the Ontario Ministry for Environment, Conservation, and Parks. Coincidentally, today is also World Wetlands Day. Uh, so this signifies the signing of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, which is a international treaty essentially signifying the importance of wetlands globally as um, an important resource, um, as well as acknowledging their important ecosystem services. Every year they have a theme, so this year it's climate change. Um, for me, when I think of wetlands, particularly in context of the St. Lawrence River, I'm thinking about them as sort of filters in the landscape. As water flows through them, uh, they will collect material, potentially contaminants, uh, such as mercury, and I'll discuss that. So just give, to give you an idea of where we're going, I'm going to start with some brief background on St. Lawrence River wetlands and Plan 2014, but you are all pretty much familiar with those two things. Then I'll get into mercury cycling, how mercury is related to Plan 2014. Then discuss some observations from 2016 and 2017 field studies. Finally, uh, then discussing um, some recent work on mercury and cattail biomass, and then going into some next steps that are much needed. This is Brandy Brook. Um, as you can see, the shoreline is vastly dominated by typha, which is commonly known as cattails. And this is probably a familiar image for many of you on the St. Lawrence River. But from above, that great blue heron might see it a little bit differently. This is around the single thread reach, and if you look within this yellow circle, notice the tan land area between that outer island and the main land. Notice it here as well. All of that tan land area is emergent cattail wetland. But the river never used to look like this. Um, since 1958, when the dam was built, stable water levels have allowed for ecotone encroachment by cattails, essentially extending to their minimum and maximum water depths. However, Plan 2014 has been proposed to um, hopefully increase diversity of these wetlands and bring back some more of that submerged aquatic vegetation necessary for fish spawning habitat. Again, we see dense cattails here, 
Note at the bottom of the screen how dense the cattails are. And those are just the stems. If you've ever seen the roots of cattails, they are extremely dense and do not prevent, do not allow for fish passage. So area that maybe previously was fish um, spawning habitat no longer is because they cannot get to it. And again, we see cattails here in this uh, sort of embayment. Unfortunately, over the past 60 years, when these wetlands uh, were developing, there has been a legacy of mercury and sulfate wet deposition in this area. Note these images only go back to 2003 and 1985, but we can infer that past deposition was just as high, if not higher, due to coal combustion. You'll note that the deposition is decreasing over time, which is good. However, because the water levels remain stable during this time period, we can infer that the legacy mercury and sulfate still remains in those wetland hydric soils. So most of you are probably familiar with mercury as a toxin. It has um, neurological as well as reproductive uh, effects on humans and other animals. And due to its chemical and physical nature, it can cycle and become transformed in the environment extensively. You'll note that it can be um, transported throughout the atmosphere what's, once it's emitted by coal burning um, power plants and travel very long distances. For example, some of the deposition we receive here in New York State is from as far as China. Once it deposits onto the landscape, it can cycle um, continuously, particularly in aquatic ecosystems. Note that when it enters wetlands or perhaps the bottom of lakes, it gets transformed into methylmercury. And this is important because methylmercury is the, perhaps the most toxic form as it can bioaccumulate in wildlife. That's the form we see in fish. This transformation mostly happens only in um, oxygen depleted zones, so in wetlands and at the bottom of lakes. And this transformation is done by mercury methylating microbes. There's a lot of fascinating research on that right now, however, the only thing you need to know for the purposes of this presentation is their sort of uh, role as these key transformers of mercury into methylmercury. So as someone studying mercury, I feel it's sort of my duty <laughs> or to do this sort of public service announcement on fish advisories. I just suggest wherever you're fishing, make sure you look um, at the local advisories for New York State, the Department of Health website has some great information on fish in different regions, including the St. Lawrence River Valley. This is a little hard to see, but oops, it doesn't do transformations. Um, there, I had a box that was going to pop up with some tips, but basically what you can take from here is um, there's PCBs, dioxin and murex. These are other contaminants in fish. and they can typically be removed somewhat if you remove the fat from the fish. Mercury is different in that it attaches to tissue, to proteins, so it cannot be easily removed um, if you want to eat the fish. Therefore, it's definitely important to be aware of advisories um, for much of the upper St. Lawrence River. Many fish cannot be consumed by women under 50 and children under the age of 15. Um, there's a little bit more flexibility for women over 50 and children or men over the age of 15, but that varies depending on region and also among fish species. So for more information, certainly check out the uh, Department of Health website. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so back to wetlands. The Upper St. Lawrence River has a diversity and abundance of wetlands. However, the diversity of flora and fauna within these wetlands has decreased dramatically due to stable water levels. And as I mentioned, Plan 2014 hopes to increase this biodiversity. However, it's been estimated that about 29% of the emergent wetlands will be lost during water level fluctuations. To flesh this out a little bit more, 
Before 1958, when water levels fluctuated naturally, they created enough disturbance to the shoreline such that no individual vegetation could dominate. You had woody plants, wetland meadow, still had emergent wetland uh, plants such as cattails, but you also had submerged aquatic vegetation providing fish habitat. Once water levels became stable, the cattails pushed out the submerged aquatic vegetation as well as the wetland meadow um, near the terrestrial zone and the dense roots of cattail also um, accumulate lots of soil over time. <coughs> Under fluctu fluctuating water levels, um, particularly high waters, will push back cattails. It'll flood some of that um, biomass near the main channel and consequently that will get transported downstream. Then you get submerged aquatic vegetation back, which is good, but you also get an accumulation of organic matter, mercury and sulfide potentially near that terrestrial area. Under low waters, that terrestrial zone dries out so you get the oxidation of organic matter, sulfide to sulfate, and the methylation of mercury by sulfate reducing bacteria and iron reducing bacteria. Um, some groups of bacteria that we know c to contain mercury methylators. And once that gets transformed to methylmercury, and we make the assumption that these water levels are going up and down, we can assume that perhaps these water level fluctuations pump this methylmercury out of the wetlands over time. To get an idea of this, we did a preliminary study in 2016 with a few um, baseline objectives, A, to determine how much legacy mercury might reside in these wetlands, and also to determine if conditions are favorable for met mercury methylation. There are four main wetland types in the St. Lawrence River. We have barrier beaches, drowned river mouths, open embayments, and protected embayments. We sampled four wetlands of each type for a total of 16 and also sampled at both land and water interfaces to assess differences in water flow, as indicated by the yellow triangles. Once the soil core was taken, we would look at it and see if there was any stratification, and those layers were separated to see if there were any differences in mercury concentration between the layers. Back at the lab, the sample gets homogenized, and then the wet sample can be used for mercury and DNA analysis. Uh, the sample can then be dried to look at nutrients, and then it can be further ashed to look at percent organic matter as well as phosphorus. Results from 2016 showed that there were significantly different mercury concentrations among wetland types. Drowned River Mouse had the highest mercury concentrations of around 110 nanograms per gram, whereas open embayments had lower concentrations around 40 nanograms per gram. There were no significant differences between the two um, water interface types we looked at, although you'll note that the near shore location does appear to have slightly higher concentrations. But you might be wondering, well, what do these concentrations mean? Are they high or are they low? Well, if we look at data from Adirondack peat wetlands, we see similar concentrations. However, if you go farther west in Minnesota, these concentrations are nearly three times higher. So we can say concentrations are neither very high or very low, but mercury is here and it's going to be impacted potentially by water level fluctuations. One of the things we were interested in proving is whether or not there are mercury methylating bacteria in these wetlands. To do this, we did a 16S rRNA bacterial community analysis just to figure out who's there, who's present, and in what kind of abundance. Um, this pie chart essentially shows the taxa summary, and we see a lot of the typical players for aquatic systems. However, the groups we're focused on are delta proteobacteria and firmicutes especially. Those are known to contain um, mercury methylating bacteria. This bar graph on the other side, which is a little hard to see, but essentially it's showing um, different abundances of these microbial groups among wetland types. Um, and there's not a significant difference among wetland types, so we can assume microbial com communities are pretty similar among wetlands on the St. Lawrence River. 
And you can't see the scale that well, but essentially it's showing the percent operational taxonomic units of these groups of microbes. And that's basically telling us the abundance. And if you, you can see that the highest percentage is around 0.5%. And that sounds very low, and it might be, but what's important to note with these microbes, it's not necessarily the abundance that's important, but the activity, and I'll touch on that later. So what does all of this mean? Well, we know mercury concentrations among wetland types. We know the area of wetlands in the St. Lawrence River, so from that we can estimate volume of soil. And from that we can estimate, sorry about that, <laughs> um, total mercury within these wetlands, within the St. Lawrence River, and then put it in context of this 29% um, loss we think we might see, which comes out to about 86 kilograms potentially getting mobilized. And this sounds like a large number, and it is, but the St. Lawrence River is a very large river. <laughs> so if you consider, this is essentially showing a one-dimensional model of mercury transport out of the St. Lawrence River over a range of time periods. So the dotted lines show the range of ambient mercury concentrations in St. Lawrence River water, typically. And each dot represents a different sort of model. So let's take one, for example, so one year of wetland erosion. If we expect to see that 29% loss within one year, that's very rapid. And sure, that might increase total concentrations in the river, but that's not very likely. It's more likely to occur on a very long time scale. So if we could extend that model toward 10 years or more, you can see that the amount of mercury is relative to the ambient concentrations already in the river. However, this model makes some assumptions. It assumes that the mercury will evenly diffuse throughout the river. However, this graph on the other side showing a two-dimensional model might suggest otherwise. So this actually came from a different project and I'd be happy to give you more information on that after if you're interested. But essentially it's showing where water tends to stay within the river. So this is a reach just above the dam, and you can see that main channel water tends to stay in the main channel. Same with water near both shores. So consider wetlands along the river. They're going to be all along the shoreline, and if material is eroded from those wetlands, it's more likely to stay along the shoreline. It's gonna be very hard for it to enter that main channel water. So we expect it's probably going to erode and then get transported a little bit downstream, but then maybe deposit somewhere else along the shoreline. In 2017, we scaled up the study. So 16 is a pretty small sample size. Um, 81 is much better. And this year, we also um, expanded the scale. So the 16 study was um, only between just above the dam up through about Ogdensburg, and it was only on the U.S. side. In 2017, we went from the dam all the way close to Cape Vincent and went on sampled on both sides of the river. And this year, we also sampled exclusively at the near shore locations, so mostly near that terrestrial zone, which we think is the key um, area where redox is going to be going up and down with um, water level wetting and drying and that's going to stimulate microbial activity. So that's where we expect to see the majority of um, mercury transformation to occur. We also subsampled for qPCR and I mentioned previously that um, knowing microbial abundance isn't as important as knowing activity and what qPCR can tell us is the activity. So from that, we should know, are these mercury methylating microbes active and potentially methylating? So comparing 2017 results to 2016, it was interesting, we saw the trend from 2016 disappear. So in 2017, 
wetlands did not have significantly different mercury concentrations in their soil. This could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe it was the flooding, kind of flushing out some of that water. Maybe it was just the increase in statistical power. Um, 81 is much, has a much better resolution than 16. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what the reasoning is, but this still tells us a lot of information about what kind of concentrations are out there, and that's useful. So again, plugging this back into our 29% uh, estimation, the number drops to about 71, but that's still a pretty um, significant number. So recall the aerial photographs I showed at the beginning. Those wetlands were very extensive, spanning some hectares in size. And we were curious to know, okay, we know spatially different wetlands along this whole river, but what about within a single wetland? How does the mercury vary spatially? If we walked in and took a sample at one location and then walked three meters away, are the concentrations gonna be the same? What about on the other side of the wetland? Well, to figure this out, we chose a sort of model wetland, a protected embayment um, on Coles Creek State Park, and did three transects to sample at nine locations. And what we found was mercury varies spatially quite a bit. It ranges in this wetland from five nanograms per gram to almost 40, which is a significant range. And I'm try to imagine this sort of heat map on top of the wetland indicating high and low concentrations. And we were hoping to see some sort of a pattern to indicate, okay, maybe terrestrial areas have higher concentrations, whereas the area nearest the main channel has lower as it gets flushed out. Um, but from this, you can see uh, that spatial trend isn't necessarily clear. So then the question becomes, what's a good predictor of mercury? Um, on this scale and on a larger scale, well, um, I mentioned in previously in our methods we analyzed percent organic matter in the soil, and literature has shown that mercury trends very strongly with percent organic matter, which makes sense because mercury will bind to and readily complex with organic matter, so it sticks to it. And comparing mercury with the percent organic matter in our nine soil samples, we get a very strong positive regression. So what we can say from this is uh, organic matter, in this case, is the better predictor for um, mercury here. So when we were doing our 2017 study, I came across a paper um, showing evidence for cattails accumulating mercury. And I thought, well, we've got a lot of cattails here. Um, are they accumulating mercury? So we know it's in the soil, but what about all of this biomass along the river in these wetlands? So we came up with a few hypotheses. First of all, trying to figure out if mercury const constitutes a significant fraction, or if typha, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> constitutes a significant fraction of total mercury in the wetlands. So we have this 71 um, kilogram estimate, but how does the mercury content in um, the biomass relate to that? or potentially increase it. And then how do mercury concentrations in cattails um, correlate with mercury concentrations in the soil? Could they potentially be used as bioindicators for the soil? And here again, we used our model wetland in the same locations um, we used previously. With the help, a lot of help <laughs> from um, a summer REU student in our lab, Carla, we went out and sampled cattails at all nine locations, um, dissected and cleaned the cattails cleanly in the lab, and then looked at concentrations in different organs within the cattails. So we separated the leaves from the root core, which is essentially this sort of transition zone separating the organs um, above the soil and the organs below the soil. We also separated the stem and the roots, the tiny little root hairs on the stem. Results showed that the roots appear to partition the majority of mercury relative to other organs and at concentrations similar to, if not a bit higher, than concentrations in the soil. Commonly, a 
if you're looking at um, the transfer of mercury or another contaminant up the food chain or through a trophic, um, trophic levels, people tend to analyze data using bioconcentration factors or bioaccumulation factors. And essentially what that does is it shows if mercury is concentrating in the organism relative to where the mercury is originating from. So here we can divide the concentrations in the soil, or in the roots, excuse me, by that in the soil. And if it's over one, we know that more mercury is getting partitioned into the roots than in the soil. And sure enough, we see a BCF of 1.6, showing that yes, mercury does um, partition a little bit more into the roots than the soil, but as you can see, based on the bar graph, not at a significant level. The translocation factor is similar, but instead of looking from um, sort of different trophic levels, or um, it looks within the organism itself. So in this case, it looks at how mercury is tra transferred from the roots to, say, the leaves. And what we can see here is very far below um, one. So it's telling us that the majority of mercury is staying in the roots. It's not getting transported up to the leaves, and that corresponds with what we see in the graph. But there are still many more questions to be asked. <laughs> um, I'd like to wrap up this cattail study by um, getting a better estimate on that 71 kilogram number, potentially adding to it. And then also measuring methylmercury in soil and main channel water. I'd like to continue the assessment of this downstream model wetland that we have at Coles Creek, but then also choose a model wetland upstream for comparison. And then begin to identify mercury hotspots in these wetlands, essentially trying to figure out where is the mercury going, in what form, and how fast. So by now you have listened to the majority of my talk and are probably waiting for me to answer the question I posed at the beginning. Will Plan 2014 create a risk for mercury mobilization? And like most questions in science, we can answer it with more questions. <laughs> and this doesn't necessarily mean we haven't learned anything. It just means that now the question evolves to how and to what extent and how fast. Um, we know, one could argue that the presence of mercury alone creates a risk, but that doesn't really tell us much. So we know the key players of mercury methylation are potentially present. We know mercury concentrations are present in potentially um, concern, not concerning, but they're present in relative concentrations and we know that there are fluctuating water levels causing potentially erosion at, these, at the shoreline, as well as causing redox changes at the terrestrial area that will stimulate microbial um, activity. We also know there's biomass essentially acting as a potential storage place for mercury. And we know this biomass can also function when it's dead <laughs> as a lot of organic matter that will also sort of filter and hold on to the mercury. And we can also consider this in context of knowing the hydrodynamics of this large river. So we know that based on um, flow of these different channels, the um, eroded material is likely to stay near the shoreline. Given these circumstances, the question evolves and we have to begin to ask, well, are we going to see hotspots? And hotspots can be defined as areas where the biota has elevated mercury concentrations. So now we have to start asking, what kind of biota is gonna be impacted? Where is the mercury getting mobilized up the food chain? Well, if you look in this picture, this um, top image is actually from um, our model wetland at Coles Creek. And in the yellow circle, those are two very tiny snails. <laughs> and if you go out at the right time later in the summer, you'll find hundreds of these little snails all over the cattail leaves. And you start to wonder, huh, are they eating the leaves? Are they taking up mercury? Is something eating them? Are they prey? Uh, what's their predator? Is it potentially 
birds, that's what you think of when you think of uh, predators for snails. Are they, do they happen to be these um, species that are of concern, like the brown thrasher and the black duck? And what would that mean for those um, populations, specifically during uh, sensitive life stages where mercury can uh, disrupt their physiology? So these are questions that we are beginning to ask and would like to move into next. So thank you for listening. So as these, uh, say, just for my, the sake of my question, say a fish over its lifetime accumulates a mass of mercury that it carries, and you said that there's a difference between being able to trim uh, the fat away to get rid of possible contaminants as, as compared to like systemic, where it's in the entire fish. Is that, is that transfer now from, say, a muskie that's been around for 15 or 20 years that's uh, going into areas where there may be some hot spots in the uh, littoral areas of the catfish, does each individual fish then have to uh, build up a mass, or does that cross between the, the muskie and the fry? I guess the question is, do they, are they born with, with uh, amounts, or do they have to accumulate them over a lifetime? So, potentially a little bit of both, but the majority of the mercury you're likely to see <clears throat> is accumulated over their lifetime. So as they eat lower, lower trophic level organisms that contain lower concentrations, they're going to take that burden on themselves. So the more prey they feed on, the more mercury they consume, and that mercury sticks around. It attaches to their tissues and accumulates over time. So what we might see is these juvenile fish, usually we find the higher concentrations in um, adult fish. So if you go and look at the um, guidelines, <coughs> they'll often say don't eat fish over a certain size and that's because it's going to have higher concentrations. But the juvenile fish are also at risk because if they're in these areas with <clears throat> mercury sort of being leached out, they're going to be consuming, um, whether it be phytoplankton or whatever they're eating, having concentrations that relative to their body size are also high. So you kind of have that dual effect going on. Thanks. a really um, interesting question and I toyed, it, toyed with it myself a bit um, and cattails have, a, have actually been used as sort of um, a source of biomass elsewhere. You'll see people sort of just mowing cattail wetlands <laughs> and what happens is they take just the leaf organ and that's the organ we found lower concentrations in so it kind of might not target what we want to. You might just have to rip out all the cattails, but that's still not going to, if there's still mercury in the soil, there's still mercury in the soil. So, um, and since these wetlands are receiving flow from the entire basin, there's still going to be um, mercury inputs and we're still gonna have atmospheric deposition, so, um, over time, there's still going to be mercury entering the system. Um, I don't think it's 
would be the most efficient option for removing mercury from the system just because A, we have such a huge area of these wetlands, it would take so much time, effort, money to um, target the issue from that perspective. But it has been used in, um, that method has been used in other areas, I believe with phosphorus. Um, cattails um, can accumulate phosphorus as well. And I believe people have mowed that biomass to reduce phosphorus inputs. Um, so that's a, an interesting question. Yeah. I've got a uh, follow-up question. Uh, Try to make the connection here between what you've uh, given us this morning and 2014. And uh, can I assume by way of your studies that uh, Typha or the cattail is a primary host of this uh, uh, mercury concentration among the vegetative mass of a uh, wetland? Relative to other species, that's um, the one I've primarily seen research on. I have seen a few papers on Phragmites, which might be of interest. Um, but in regards to the submerged aquatic vegetation, um, I haven't seen a lot done on that. So well, it seems that cattails are the primary vegetation sort of storage place. So my follow-up uh, uh, assumption then is that uh, if the question so and I think it's going to depend on time scale so if we consider immediate effects of cattails dying off and decomposing somewhere we might get sort of isolated areas with um, organic matter with high mercury burden and that wouldn't necessarily be good that might create sort of these concern this concern for hot spots <coughs> but, but long term if uh I mean, if, if Plan 14, as I envision it, uh, works as we expect it will, uh, you will have, uh, over time, uh, uh, not an overabundance of cattail for disposal, given your point. And we would have a more balanced uh, vegetative composition of emergence and submergence. Uh, and I, I guess I'm concluding that that, uh, in the long range, will be beneficial from the standpoint of uh, mercury transfer and yeah. concentration. I, I would agree. So you'd end up having less mercury sort of sticking around in these right. wetlands and it would just sort of diffuse into the river over time and probably, you know, maybe stick around those ambient level concentrations rather than getting this sort of mass transport out that we might see at first. Thank you. Your, your research is uh, fascinating and uh, I wish you luck in uh, moving forward with it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, way in the back there. Thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, a quick question with a short answer on phragmites. <laughs> Does it uptake mercury faster than pipes or not? And, and then uh, uh, a quick question on why did you choose this topic? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so your first question, if I'm being completely honest, I've only glanced at a couple studies looking at this and <clears throat> Usually these studies are also done in areas with high point source pollution, so it might be near a mining area, and the concentrations or the um, effects seen there don't translate as well to an area that's just receiving atmospheric deposition. So even if I was sure what, what those numbers from the studies were, I'm not sure they would be readily applicable here. For example, the bioconcentration factor and translocation factors I saw here 
were lower than what I saw in the original study I found. Um, and that's just because they were looking at sort of a point source um, pollution standpoint, so they had more mercury to move, basically. Um, so in terms of Phragmites versus cattails, um, that's a good question that needs to be answered. <laughs> and what was the spark that caused you to take up this research? Well, um, I essentially got involved with the study my, the summer before my senior year of undergrad, and I've always been interested in aquatic systems. I grew up near Lake Champlain, um, and then I moved closer um, in this direction and realized how fascinating the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River are, and um, pollutants are a very important issue right now. Um, mercury has been a long-term issue, and um, there is still a lot to know, a lot to be understood in terms of regulating it, and when I got involved with the study in Dr. Twist's lab, um, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's a great combination of field work and lab work, um, and I get to um, interact with great people such as yourselves. <laughs> Thank you.